All right, so we're going to start our study on Ruth this morning. So this is a short series. It's only four classes, which sets up pretty perfectly for Ruth, given it's only four chapters. So our schedule for this. So today we'll do an intro into Ruth, just kind of overview um, of author, date, setting, purpose, that kind of stuff. Then we'll go over chapter one, and then each week we'll do a new chapter, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four. Um, in the in the coming weeks. So open platform here. Um, I encourage questions, discussion. Um, so feel free. If you've got a question, if you've got something you want to discuss, bring it up as we go through it. So, so as we start a new study, I always like to um, start just kind of get a context of the of the book that we're reading. So the author of Ruth is um, stated as unknown. We don't know. It's not stated in the Bible. It's not stated anywhere in Ruth, the author of, um, of Ruth. That being said, there are several commentaries that have put out that they believe that Samuel is the author of Ruth. But given the context of different things that will happen that we'll talk about uh, in Ruth, it's very unlikely that that happened given that Samuel died before David became king. Um, And in Ruth 17 and verse 22, Ruth chapter 4, 17 and verse 22, it talks about, um, it talks about, uh, or it implies that David's kingship is in place or established at that time of the writing. Therefore, the author, um, it it most likely can't be Samuel for this. So we're going to leave it as unknown that we don't know who the author of uh, of Ruth is. Um, All right. Next thing is the date when it was written. So we don't have an exact date of when it was written, but given that we just talked about in the general conclusions that uh, uh, King David was, or David was king at the time of the writing, uh, we know that uh, from 2 Samuel that uh, that that time was around 1010 BC of him being uh, being king, uh, him becoming king. That being said, we don't have an exact time. Another key clue about um, this timeline is that in four in verse seven, in chapter four in verse seven, it says, "Now this this was the custom in former times in Israel." Israel, kind of given a, a context of the book or the writing being in former former times, so times of the judges, which we'll learn here in, in uh, chapter one as well. So. Happened before, during the time of the judges. This would therefore place the right writing after the judges because of the context of the writing. So, while David was on the throne. All right. Purpose of this writing. When I go into a, to a new uh, study or anything, like I used to like to know the why. Like, why was this written for me? Why is this in the Bible? Uh, so that, you know, for my understanding, for my knowledge, what's the purpose for... Um, for the the text being in the Bible or being included. So if you'll remember back in uh, 1 Kings chapter 12, the 12 tribes were divided into two nations. You had Judah and you had Israel that were divided into two nations. There are several commentaries that are out there that would come to believe that this book could have been written because of Ruth's... um, purpose for all of Israel and thought for all of her concern for all of Israel, it could have been written or could have been uh, included here to, you know, with the thought process of trying to reunite the the kingdoms, the two kingdoms together. Now that that does kind of make sense given in in Ruth, it talks about in four and seven, it talks about all of Israel. You know, the concern there was for all of Israel and it would make sense for this book given that you had a Moabite and somebody from Israel or somebody from Judah, Bethlehem, coming together, it would make sense to utilize that story for that purpose. Now, we also know that this, is, this links the um, genealogy of David through Ruth. And we know where David, the genealogy of David leads on to the genealogy of Christ. So this is the book that links that, uh, that genealogy of those as well. So those are just some of the purposes of this book that gives us uh, ideas of what we're like going to. So before we go into the setting, because to get into the setting, we have to really dive into the text at the very beginning. Any questions, comments as we go into that? 
this is kind of um, more, this beginning part was just kind of open platform as what we're getting into, into as we go. Okay, so if I got nothing, we're going to go into the setting. So let's turn to Ruth chapter 1. Ruth chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 1 through 5. It says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malon and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Okay, so as far as the setting goes, at the very beginning... We see, I usually like to look at this uh, just to kind of give me some context of where this is occurring. I usually put, I usually like to look at a map. Okay, so first thing I'm going to, I'm going to go forward here to the beginning. So this is modern day here, and this is the, the biblical map during the time. So you'll see here, here's Moab down here, and here's Bethlehem in Judah. Okay, modern day, let me make sure I go forward. Modern day here, this is the Dead Sea that runs between them. This is all Jordan. This whole area here is Jordan now, and all of this is Israel at this time, with Bethlehem being right up here. So it kind of gives us a general context of where, uh, where this occurred. It's just, that's more kind of the way my mind works. I just like to get a, a recollection of exactly, um, exactly what we're dealing with as we go through this. All right. So in verse 1, the text tells us, In the days when the judges ruled. What do we know about the time of the judges? <laughs> What's that? Cycles of ten. Back and forth, right? Back and forth. What else do we know? <laughs> See? Wild and, wild and crazy time. Every man did what was right in his own eyes, which is what I have here. Let's turn, first let's turn to Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2. And can I get a volunteer to read verses 16 through 19? Judges chapter 2, 16 through 19. See, we have a microphone. We may not. I don't think we do. I'll tell you what, I'll read this while they get a microphone. All right, 16, so we're going to read Judges chapter 2, verses 16 through 19. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and were corrupt. Then They were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them, and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. Okay, so that gives us a real overview. And the other, the other verse is what Peggy uh, brought up here, is Judges chapter 17 and verse 6. Steve, you want to read that? Judges chapter 17 and verse 6. Uh, Judges 17, verse 6. And the man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod and household gods, and ordained one of his sons who became his priest. Uh, I don't think that's 17. I'm sorry, oh, Oh, in those, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. All right, so everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And we, could, we, we have an idea of what that, uh, what that is like. Um, troubled times, 
a lot of violence, a lot of crime. Um, Israelites were uh, entertaining themselves with Canaanite idolatry. There was war, discord, strife. So just, just uh, a free-for-all pretty much at this point in time. So it gives us a really good idea of um, the, the time frame that they're in. So there was a famine in the land. There was a famine in the land. And Elimelech decided to take his family, he elected to take his family out of Bethlehem because of the famine and head for the country of Moab. What do we know about the country of Moab? They had been at war with Israel. Let's read. Let's turn over. Let's turn over to Genesis. Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19. And we're going to read verses 30 through 38. If somebody wants to read that. Genesis 19, 30 through 38. Yes. Jim, will, Jim will do it right here. Starting with uh, verse 30, it says, Lot departed from Zoar and lived in the mountains along with his two daughters because he was afraid to live in Zoar. Instead, he and his two daughters lived in a cave. Then the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man in the land to sleep with us, as is the custom of all the land. Come, let us get our father to drink wine so that we can sleep with him and preserve our father's line. So they got, got their father to drink wine that night, and the firstborn came and slept with her father. He did not know when she lay down or when she got up. The next day, the firstborn said to the younger, Look, I slept with my father last night, so let's get him to drink wine again tonight so that you can sleep with him and we can preserve our father's line. That night, they again got their father to drink wine, and the younger went in and slept with him. And he did not know when she lay down or when she got up. Through 38. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, please. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. The firstborn gave birth to a son and named him Moab. He is the father of the Moabites of today. And the younger also gave birth to a son, and she named him Ben-Ami. He is the father of Ammonites of today. Thank you. So we get the context of the beginning of the Moabites. Um, it was started with sin. It began with sin. The creation started again. And you could say that, they, you know, this, that uh, there were issues within that country from the, from the very beginning. So do you think that the Israelites, or that, that they respected, do you think this would be a respectable uh, um, uh, situation that they would be going into? Steve says no. Obviously, most likely not. Um, let's turn over to Deuteronomy 23. Deuteronomy chapter 23. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. While you're turning, uh, just a, a background kind of thing. Not sure where this fits in. But uh, whenever I see something like the first of this writing of Ruth, uh, it came about that there was a famine. Mm -hmm. Makes me think of Providence. Providence, yeah. So while we're reading... I'm, I'm watching for God's hand to put things in place and, in a certain way. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And we'll obviously see that as we transition through, Kyle. One other, thing, one other item on Providence is that Zor is the city that Lot fled to, that he was permitted to go to and uh, to escape Sodom and Gomorrah. And that was permitted by, uh, by, God, by God to allow him to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Providence. All Providence. Okay, so Deuteronomy 23, 3 through 6, I'll read that here. It says, No Ammonite or, or Moabite may enter the assembly of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation, none of them may enter the assembly of the Lord forever. Because they did not meet you with bread and with water on the way when you came out of Egypt. And because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, from Pethor of Mesopotamia to curse you. But the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam. Instead, the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you. 
because the Lord your God loved you. You shall not seek their peace or their prosperity all your day, all your days forever. So it gives us an idea of the Lord's, the, the, the Lord's, or this is Moses talking here, given, uh, talking to the Israelites about how they, you know, they sh- how they should feel about the Ammonites and the, Mo- and the Moabites. So there was not a very, uh, um, there was not a very good, uh, dialogue between the Moabites and the Israelites at this point. Um, so what do we know about the country of, of Moab? Yeah, what do we know about the country of Moab itself? Especially given what we just talked about in Genesis. Some of the commentaries that I read that, that I read about this that would give us the closest comparison would be like um, like Las Vegas, and you go to Las Vegas and your son marries a, a showgirl. That that's uh that's some of the uh, commentary that I got. Um, like you said, Moab was, was uh, inhabited by the descendants of Lot, and Israel didn't think very highly of them. Um, during the early period of the judges, Eglon, the king of Moab, had invaded Israel and pressed them into servitude for 18 years. So we talked about that a little bit earlier, about the wars that, that uh, took place there. So would this, um, given the situation they're in here, would this have been advised by other people? If Elimelech would have went and talked to you know, other individuals, do you think it would have been advised for him to go to the country of Moab? No. no. Most likely not, right? Just given the context of everything we just read, most likely would not have. I think it gives us a very good clue just as far as the spirituality of Israel at that point. We talked about the cycle that they went through, but there's even a question of knowledge. You know, I kind of question just how knowledgeable most Israelites were of God's word. By Mm -hmm. this time, maybe they didn't even have a good clue that this was a bad idea. Yeah. And even though that's God had strictly prohibited it. That's a good point. Something I didn't really think about whenever I was talking about. But Steve, that the fact that they were so far removed at this point that they wouldn't. Ha- they didn't even have an idea of of uh, uh, whether that was a good idea or a bad idea. Uh, yeah, Keegan, this uh, you, you've spurred a thought uh, when you you know we're always trying to apply these lessons to our current day, of course, so we can teach our kids and our grandkids and learn ourselves. I mean, you think of uh, today. You go to this great university here, and then hey, I got a job in New York City. I'm on Wall Street, or Oh, well, where, where are you going? I'm going to, to Seattle or Portland or San Francisco. Um, I, you know, I think there's some consideration for a Christian to say, you know, I'm not going to take that job in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to stay here in the Republic of Texas, which there's, there's plenty of sin here, too, of course. <laughs> but uh, you see what I'm saying? In other words, yeah. we make these calculated decisions that are lifestyle decisions that do have an impact on our lives and serving the Lord. And I think the point you're making is this wasn't a very good decision. No, no, absolutely. I saw saw a thing that came up the other day was if you want to have, if if you, uh, um, you know, want to stay faithful to your wife, have friends that stay faithful to their wife. If you want to do, you know, all these different things, surround yourself with the people that, that have the same type of character that you have or that you want to have. I was just also going to add that, um, they were leaving the land that where God promised to bless them. So they, you know, forgot about that or, or took yeah, that for granted. They instead went somewhere else. Went somewhere else. Now, given, now, granted that, I mean, there was famine there. So there was reason, obviously, for them to, to leave there. But, I mean, there are other places that they most likely could have went. But this, this uh, goes back to Brother Dick, what you brought on. This is uh, with the famine of land. You have this thought thought process of that uh, God has his hands on this as we go through. Okay, so in 2 and verse 3, uh, in 2 and verse 3, Elimelech passes away, and Naomi is left with just her two sons, Malon and Chilion. Okay, in verse 4, both sons married Moabite women. So not only did they move to the city of Moabite, or to, to the country of Moab, the sons took on Moabite women. And I believe what we've talked about already up to this point, we probably know if whether that would have been advised or not advised. 
that could, we could have kind of answered that question already in itself. Was it forbidden for them to marry Moabite women? Forbidden? It was not forbidden. There was, there was no structure in place that would forbid them to marry. It was just highly discouraged. Um, I, you, would, you would think from all of the context that, that has come through a lot of this, and correct me if I'm wrong, I see a lot of faces out there, but from everything that I've read in this, it was not forbidden for them to, not forbidden for them to marry Moabite women, but it was um, highly discouraged given the context that was in place. Um, it, was, it was frowned upon. Now, and it was frowned upon because of everything that we just talked about, because of their commitment to other gods, because of the Balaam debacle, because of Israel's debauchery with Moabite women in the wilderness, and also because of the 10-generation Moabite male exclusion from the assembly of the Lord. So all of these different things would have led you to believe that it was, it's not... It's not ideal for them to marry, Moabite, to marry a Moabite woman at this time. But it took place. Um, at that point, then, in verse 5, it says that also both of her sons passed away. So both Malon and Chilion both died, leaving Naomi, Ruth, and Orpah as widows. What do we know about widows at this point in time? And what situation was Naomi in at this point, given what we know about widows? Call over here. No, you're good. I don't really know. I, I remember there's a bunch of different marriage laws on, you know, how if, if you were widowed, you know, certain family members would ha- you know, have the opportunity. I don't remember all that, but I would just say women at this time are not like the women of today where you have much more opportunity to have, you know, get a job and stuff like that. So, I mean, it was kind of, I mean, you're in a bad situation. Yeah, I, I wanted uh, another thing that they, they related it to, le, you know, less than a slave because a slave is taken care of. Uh, a widow has nobody to take care of them. She had no family, no, no one to take care of them. Jim, you had some. There were no uh, relief agencies in, 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 uh, to, to care for them like we, we have in this day and time. The, if they didn't have a family to care for them, they had to make do as best they could on their own. Yeah, they had no, no food, no shelter. Um, it, it was not uncommon for this, uh, women in this situation um, to, go into, to go into prostitution, destitution, homelessness. Um, and abuse was likely what a woman like Naomi had in store for her at this point in time. Just, just because she had, she had no way to... Um, you know, make a living. Uh, unmarried women at that point, or, or widow, widowed women at that point, were uh, just did not have a good. They were not in a good position. So you, you, we give ourselves. We know now, um, you know what situation Naomi was in. So that's kind of the introduction to the setting of the story, and then it transitions into the first scene. Yeah. yeah. Aaron. The thing about the intermarriage was bugging me, so I had to find it. Uh, in uh, let's see, what is this? Deuteronomy chapter 7, the Israelites were specifically forbidden from mar- intermarrying with the Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Uh, Moabites and, and the Ammonites weren't specifically listed there. However, what we find by the time of Ezra and Nehemiah is that there's a more generaliz- generalized uh, problem with the intermarriage of foreign women. And by the time you get to... Uh, I believe it's Malachi chapter 2 and verse 9. He says, Judah has acted treacherously, uh, for Judah has profaned the Lord's sanctuary and has married the daughter of a foreign god. So the real issue was not just the specific nations that they were intermarrying with, but the idea of marrying themselves to these foreign gods, which is where, and the Moabites and the Ammonites were among the more profligate people 
worshiping foreign gods yeah. uh, to the Israelites at this time, and one of the more corrupting influences on them, as evidenced by Balaam. Yeah, very open, right? They were openly worshiping other, other gods. Um, that, that individuals would have known about that at that time. Um, thank you. Thanks for pulling that for me. <laughs> All right, so let's go over to Ruth. Um, let's turn back to Ruth here, and we are going to read verses 6 through 14. Can I get a volunteer to read 6 through 14? Cole's got it. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from this place where she was uh, with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt, uh, sorry, as you have dealt with death and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that, my, that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband." If I, should, if I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband, this night should bear and bear sons, would therefore wait until they are grown, uh, when they are grown? Would you, you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter for me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, uh, but Ruth clung to her. You said through 16, right? That's it. No, okay. through 14. You're good. Thank you. Okay. So as Naomi was working in the fields, um, there were others that told her uh, there in Moab, she hears that a famine, that the famine was over in Judah. So she decides she's going to pick up and she's going to decide to, re- to return back to Bethlehem to her own hometown. So Ruth and Orpah tell her, return, she tells Ruth and Orpah, return each of you to your mother's house. Why do you think she told her that? Remember, yeah, yeah, remember what we just talked about, right? The position that Naomi was in is the same position that the other two were in as well, right? They were in the exact same position. Now, what we also know from later on in chapter two, that uh, it does state that Ruth's father was still alive. If her father was still alive, what does that give her? Security, protection. She, she had the ability to go back and be taken care of at that point in time. She also, they also know that, um, uh, Naomi also knew that uh, a mother's, um, I'm trying to say, a mother's, Role a mother has a crucial role in the uh, trying to say here preparing a woman for marriage or preparing a woman for childhood. So the mother had a large role in that. And if their mother was still alive or they had family that's still alive that could help them through this, even though that they had already gone through this, they they would be in much better hands going back than they would be staying with her because she had a really good, she had a not, she knew what she was going to get into or what she was getting into as she, as she gone back. Any more comments on that before we go um, for, further? Yeah. Something that we haven't really touched on is the concept of the Moabitess in and of itself is very, um, complicated with Israel at this time. The Moabite women especially were seen as seducers. Uh um, And that is a concept that you see come up over and over in Ruth. People expect her to be filling this role of the Moabitess and she constantly shows that she is not going to be 
that kind of woman. Yeah. Um, so I think that's something to keep in the back of your mind as well as we go through this study. Yeah, just like we read in, in Genesis earlier, there's this underlying judgment already about Ruth, given her, um, her tile, title of being a Moabite. So that being said, were, were Orpah and Ruth required to stay with Naomi? No, they were not required to stay with Naomi. Um, and, the, and if anything, as we just talked about, it's in their best interest to leave Naomi at this point and go back to their home so that they have financial support and so that they have restructure or they have structure and can remarry, okay? Um, Cole, you kind of hit on this er- earlier about the Leverite law and how they, you know, they would marry um, if they were widowed, they would marry the next brother. Obviously, that's not the case here. They don't have um, any more brothers at this time. And that's what Naomi's talking about here as she goes uh, down. What is this in, um, in, in verse 12? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait Till they were grown. So that's where, that's what that's implying there is, would you wait on their brothers to come so that they could marry you? Obviously not. They're going to, you're going to, they're going to be way too old at that point. Once that, uh, once that take takes place. So then we see that at the end in their, as they depart, um, Orpah kissed Naomi almost as a sign of, uh, you know, as a sign of departure because she had already promised that she was going to stay with her. And then Ruth does what? Ruth clings to her. And this is kind of that first display of, you know, her true character, the loyalty that she has, you know, the devotion that she has to Naomi, Um, which for a Moabite woman, would you expect this? Or would an Israelite expect this? No, you wouldn't expect this. Yeah. So... Maybe I'm stretching a little bit here, but if you go back, she's a Moabite who's a descendant of Lot. Lot left Abraham to go to greener fields. And this is kind of coming full circle. She's leaving greener fields to come back to God's land, to a place that's not great right now. Uh So it's kind of like a full circle of the Lot story. They're getting, his people are getting back into God's people. Yeah, they're just almost following trouble, right? They're just... It's this, this whole circle of it. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Else? All right, so let's read 15 through 18. Ruth 1, 15 through 18. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more, and more also, if anything, but death parts from me, parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. What's the significance of, uh, of verse 16 and 17? Yeah. That, that's effectively Ruth declaring herself a proselyte. Yeah, absolutely. Down here. I think this is a beautiful example of what our personal example can be to others. Ruth saw God through Naomi. Mm -hmm. She saw how it had affected Naomi's life and how it had affected her life. And she did not want to give that up. She wanted to cling to that as she Mm -hmm. was clinging to Naomi. Yeah, she's essentially declaring for the Lord here, right? Through, Through Naomi. She, she's, uh, you know, declaring her reverence to the Lord at this point, that she's going with her, she's going to be with her God, she's going she's gonna to follow through with her, which was, would not be 
um, expected, as we've talked about, from a woman of her, um, uh, where she came from. Um, and again, this shows her true dedication, shows her loyalty, shows her kindness, and just her determination in general to, uh, uh, to follow up what she saw was right, um, given Naomi's uh, 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 position. Cool. Uh, I'm kind of jumping ahead some, but I just think you, you kind of see Naomi's like attitude towards God in a sense in these passages. She's already kind of brought up some of it, just like she's like depressed and the, yeah. like he, he's dealt poorly with me. And she's probably saying this to her daughters-in-law and she just announced that she wants to be part of this God. I'm like, you know, Naomi hasn't been very <laughs> convincing and it's like you just chose that. So I feel like that's kind of another thing that, you know, to give yourself to somebody for that, that that's a whole other, to me, view on that that makes her loyalty or you know, just why, why would you even want to do that if she knows that the God that she's joining is... Yeah, you got to imagine. I mean, obviously, we're about to come up to it here in just a minute, but you've got to imagine that uh, there was, uh, you know, Na- Naomi was not in a good place. She knew her situation, and, and uh, she, you know, there could have been some moaning, some groaning about what was going on and what had taken place in her life. I mean, think about it, right? She just lost her husband and two sons in 10 years. In a matter of 10 years, she lost her husband and two sons. Um, What's that? To Joe, to Joe, yep, yep. He complains as well, right? So, um, so yeah, I think that's great, Cole. I think, uh, you know, knowing that context of, she was probably hearing a lot from Naomi, and still, even to that point, knew, um, you know, they decided to, to follow her. Okay, so um, we're going to read 19 through 22. Uh, I think we probably hit this already. Okay, we're going to go through 19 through 22 here. Um, 19 through 22. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned for the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Okay, so what's Naomi's mindset? And we kind of just hit this, Cole. What, what's, what was Naomi's mindset as they returned back to Bethlehem? Heard something. Upset. Yeah, no, probably you just didn't understand it. Didn't understand um, why. You know, she's probably thinking, why me? Why? I mean, you could think about all, all those situations. Depressed. Yeah, depressed. I mean, um, given her. Yeah, go ahead. Not only did she. She didn't ask, why did God let this happen? She said, God did this. Did this, yeah. So she was very embittered and for dis- something obviously disappointed she Yeah, she, she it wasn't aware of. She said, I mean, she felt that the Lord was punishing her for something that she was not aware of that she had done. A sin maybe that she, she was, I think she was implying it to, did I sin or, and did I do something that I'm not aware of that, uh, that I'm getting punished for? Um, so was, was this justified? Were her feelings justified? It's a tough question, right? And that's what I like to do, right? I, I like to put myself in that situation. If I was in that situation, would I feel justified for being upset, mad, angry? Um, probably so. I'd, I'd, I'd feel justified for that. 
Yeah, I, I love this chapter of the Bible, and I love it for the reason that, you know, you look at something that's going on here, and you can relate. I mean, how many times a day do we look at our circumstances, and and we get to this point of feeling like, you know, the world's against us, and yeah. nothing we can do is right. Yeah. But yet, what you also see with this part of the Bible is the importance of fellowship, of family, of friends, and how there always needs to be some torchbearer to pick up when we're all at our weak point in life. And, I mean, that's the story of Christ, right? I mean, to have somebody that can come and help you in your darkest hour. So th th this is here for us today to sit back and look at when we're going through difficult trials and tribulations. This is exactly how we should look at it. Absolutely. And we need and you're to gonna see, surround I'm, ourselves with people like that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of steal some of what Jacob did last in the last quarter and, and do some key takeaways real quick here in, here in just a minute. And that's, that's some of that I have on there is there is so much application within this, um, within this story that we can utilize within our, in our own lives. I think one of the key things that I've taken away from our study of the Psalms this year is the capacity for human beings to hold more than one emotion and thought about something at the same time. Mm -hmm. So many of the Psalms have that thread of feeling frustrated or depressed or angry or bitter about things that are going on and, and sometimes towards God while also simultaneously saying, but I trust in the Lord. Yeah. We have this kind of, and God created us with that capacity for to, to have, to feel multiple things about something at the same time. And so here, Naomi's, we, we don't question Naomi's trust in the Lord because Ruth follows her for the Obviously. reason, for those reasons. And yet Naomi's expressing that, that bitterness and that frustration that she has with the lack of understanding that she feels towards what's going on. And Again, never has that really been clearer than when you read through the Psalms and you see the, the frustrations and the uh, expressed in those Psalms while also maintaining a level of trust and faith in God. Yeah. Yeah. As you mentioned, no way that that wasn't going on, given that uh, Ruth decided to stay with her and, and uh, profess her, her uh, commitment to the Lord. Um, so it says they returned around the time of the barley harvest, would have, which would have been around uh, like April, May, just uh, for context. All right, but I'm going to go through this real quick. Um, key takeaways. So God's people experience his power, wisdom, and love. And the second point is very important to exactly what you're talking about. Sometimes that happens in times of hard circumstances. Sometimes it's, it's hidden in, in this, uh, you know, time of famine, uh, this time of having to leave your home country, you know, your own country to go to a, fo to a foreign country. Sometimes these things happen in bad times, and we can apply that in our lives, right? That we, can, we have to sometimes look underneath the, the under or overlying situation that's taking place at time. The other thing is, Ruth leads by example, okay? Ruth leads by example and shows us how to be loyal, devoted, faithful, kind, kindness, and most of all, willing to suffer because she was willing to suffer knowing what she, by committing to go with Naomi, she was committing herself to have to suffer because she knew what she was in store for, what was in store for her having to go back to Naomi, having to work, having to essentially provide for herself. They, she didn't know anything about Boaz at this point. She knew, all she knew is that she was going to have a tough living going. She was willing to suffer that and follow Naomi to be committed to her. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all your comments.